There's nothing like a professional presentation. Is there? there you go. All right. So we are doing healthy lives. Um, I have exactly the same disclaimer again, just to be sure. All right. Before that still applies. So let's have a quick look. Um, just a reminder. So God wants us to. I've gone crazy. Yeah. Slightly. So there's the slide. Where am I to do? Keys, good, all the stuff that we got from before. God wants us to have healthy lives, and that includes our relationships. And God's word is a foundation for a healthy perception and his look at relationships. So, part two, we're talking about marriage. Um, I've got a lot more quotes on this one. This is Rita Rudner said, I love being married. So great to find that one special person you want to annoy for the rest of your life. <laughs> there you go. But previously, um, a quick summary of what we learned about relationships because it's so integral. So, relationships are the connections between people. God's people are marked by their relationships. Relationships vary greatly. They're based on love, care, respect, appreciation, and forgiveness. Um, and we show them through how we feel about people, what we're like as people how we think about people, and how we act and treat people. And that's very true because if you think about people, think about someone from your childhood who you loved dearly and you know loved you dearly, and I bet they made you feel good. I bet um, they were likable as a person, they were lovable or lovely. They, were, they probably, you know, thought and treated you like they... They thought well of you or wanted good things for you, and they did, they did something special with you. And they're the kind of people we look back and go, well, I, you know, grandpa or grandma or whoever it was that behaved in those kind of ways. And you knew you were loved by the actions and the way they, they treated you, looked after you. Relationships require both people to be active in the relationship. One person's commitment and foundation of maybe is no guarantee of success, and another person's Lack of commitment foundation or poor behavior is not an excuse for them to treat them the same. So it's a measure of our character. It's not how we treat people, how people treat us, but how we treat others. So what is marriage? Marriage, according to the dictionary, is the state of being, a husband and wife, or the mutual relationship it represents. Obviously, this victory in the dictionary was published uh, some years ago, okay, because it's, it can be changed. Into a certain degree. It's the institution whereby men and women are joined in a special kind of social and legal dependence. And there's a lot of key words in there. Now, the thing is, a lot of people have different ideas about marriage. In some cultures, it's arranged, in some cultures, it's for love. In our own culture, our Western culture, love-based relationships is actually a relatively modern idea. It's only been around for a few hundred years. They were very much arranged going back three or four hundred years ago. Okay? How young is it appropriate to get married? How old is it appropriate to get married? Is, is an age difference between the people? Does it matter or does it not matter? And it's interesting that people have quite complicated views about that, in that they'll see someone who's 70 marrying someone who's 80, Okay, and they'll be, yeah, sure, they're both old, whatever. Okay, but if you saw someone who was 15 marrying someone who was 25, the same age gap um, has a bigger sway. People would not be comfortable with that because of probably the maturity gap, okay, between the two. All right, how long should a marriage last? People have different ideas about this. What is allowed in a marriage and what is not allowed in a marriage? Okay, who's the boss? In the marriage, okay. Who can marry who? We had, yeah. There's some people that are pointing right now. Um, yes, which the, you can keep that yourself. Okay, but who can marry who? We've had a lot of legal things changing in different parts of the world about that recently. And how do you end the marriage? Do you consciously uncouple, like Chris Martin and Gwyneth Paltrow, or do you scratch each other's eyeballs out? I don't know. Different people marriages that these things, and all of these questions and more create a huge amount of variations in what people think about marriage. So here's some quick statistics about marriage. Rates of, of de facto relationships doubled between 1986 and 2006. 
rates of de facto relationships are increasing at an increasing rate. So in other words, by 2026, it will, it will be more than double what it was in 2006. Um, in 2006, 77% of married couples lived together before being um, before married. And it's very, very hard to actually track the success of de facto relationships and people just living together. There's no paperwork they need to fill in at the start and the end. So there's a lot of de facto relationships that may come and go without it ever getting including any, any official statistics. Marriage rates are declining as de facto relationships grow, and people are waiting longer to get married. Okay, it's it's you know, this is not unusual. I was working with a guy, he got married to his partner who he had four children with. They've been together for 27 years, and they decided, let's have a honeymoon, let's get married and have a honeymoon. I don't know why, but they put it off for whatever reason. And de facto relationships are increasingly being seen as an alternative to marriage. Okay. Oscar Wilde said, uh, this is a quote, I am not in favour of long engagements. They give people the opportunity of finding out each other's character before marriage, which I think is never advisable. Because if we found out what they were really like, we probably never marry them. Okay. Sorry? Did you just say amen to that? She said thank you. Thank you, yes. Uh, now, here's some quick statistics about divorce. The longer the marriage, the more likely it is to end in divorce. Okay, and for each year of a, of a child's life, there's about a 1% chance their parents will divorce. So for a 20-year-old has a 20% chance of their parents divorcing. A 15-year-old has approximately a 15% chance of their parents divorcing. And apart from a peak around 1976, which is when the no-fault no divorce legislation came in. Um, apart from that, relation a divorce, the divorce rate has actually remained pretty steady for the last 40 years. You can see it there on this graph. It's, it's actually been pretty steady. It's wobbled around a little bit. It's not gone up or down remarkable. So to put this into context, let's, let's have a look at some graphs. So in 1982, let's say that's how many people got married, all right? And then that's how many people just lived together, okay? Now we know that a certain percentage of those marriages ended in divorce. We don't know, but let's assume, uh, so therefore we could say that the ones that didn't end in divorce were successful marriages, yeah? Okay, we don't necessarily know how many of the living togethers ended up splitting up because we don't have statistics. Okay, if we compare that to now, there's less people getting married, but the same amount of people getting divorced. Okay, there's more people living together. So what we see is successful marriages has come down. Okay, the divorce rate hasn't gone up, but there's less and less marriages to fail. So with the same divorce rate, there's less successful marriages. Now, we don't necessarily know how many of the living together break up, but let's assume it's about the same proportion of people, all right? So they have unsuccessful de facto relationships. In all likelihood, it's probably less likely to be successful, but we don't have concrete hard statistics. But what that means is if you put all the successful relationships together and all the unsuccessful relationships together, nowadays there are substantially more unsuccessful relationships. Whether they're married or de facto, there's more of them not lasting compared to those that are lasting. All right? People, marriage is actually incredibly popular nowadays. People love to get married. They love spending or, or if, even better if they can, they love their parents spending, you know, $50,000 on their wedding so they can have that special Instagrammable day. But that doesn't mean they love staying married forever. People now think about marriages in the same way that we think about careers. It's no longer an expectation that a career will last your lifetime. It's in the same way that people just assume 
you'll have multiple careers in a lifetime. You'll have multiple long-term and not um, relationships in your lifetime, whether they're de facto or de facto. It's just what people see now. All of this, of course, is based on the faulty thinking that a long marriage is, by definition, a successful marriage. Okay, and just because a marriage has been long doesn't mean it's not miserable. Okay, and before we had the no fault divorce, there were plenty of people that were trapped in miserable but long lasting relationships. Okay, so a marriage can be long and still not be a reflection of God's expectations. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, it says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So we are to be a reflection of God's expectations and we're meant to reflect well on him. Our marriage relationships should reflect well on God. Okay? First Corinthians chapter 5, verse 12 says, What am I to do to judge them also that are without? It is not our job to judge the rest of the world or their relationships. Okay, we are not meant to be an organization focused on political change or governmental change. And so with relationships outside of the church, we're meant to be faith focused on spiritual change, and it's our job to maintain God's expectations in his church. And our behavior is meant to reflect well on him, including our marriages. And we don't judge the relationships outside of the church, but do we want to be influenced by them? And this is a this is a really Strong thing that we need to be aware of is the children that we're bringing up in the Lord, okay? That may not, you know, particularly if you've got a teenager who comes along um, and then let's say their parents don't come along, they may not have seen a healthy marriage relationship that operates according to God's rules. How are we bringing up our children to understand these things? Okay, here is a, a quote uh, from a, an Irish comedian. Uh, most heterosexual people in this country and around the world meet each other and get together with one another when they're totally, totally drunk. Smashing out their minds, they could not spell their own face. And they go home with that person. And you might spend months with that person, or a year, or you might have a family. This is what happens. This is how you meet. But you wouldn't buy a toaster when you're drunk because that's too important. It's got to be crispy in just the right way, hasn't it? And it just kind of shows the weird perversity of our priorities in the, you know, when we go electrical goods shopping, we want to be clear-minded to make sure we get a good deal and, you know, it's going to work with us and everything like that. But where do most, a lot of people meet partners? In bars. They go to clubs. It, it's, it's, you know, you wouldn't, anyway. The role models that people have today in the media are just not good role models. This person, I blacked out their face so that we don't get sued. Okay, her first marriage famously lasted 55 hours. Okay, her second marriage lasted two years, eight months, and 25 days. Pop stars sing about love all the time. And kids grow up listening to pop stars singing about love and take on all of those words that they hear and think they're being taught about true love, okay? But these people aren't good role models. They have, yeah, let, let's think about films. Films, we have romance films. You know, they can be incredibly romantic, but, uh, you know, they don't always end up well, okay? He died, she let go. Okay, she said, I'll get her let go, I'll get her let go. Just like that. She didn't even, look, look I'll accept, I'll accept that the door that they were in, the big piece of wood she was on, didn't have the flotation capacity to hold them both. It might have had the size, but if they both got on it, it went underneath the water. I'll accept that grudgingly. But why did she keep on the life vest when he was the one in the water? Oh. <laughs> okay, celebrities, people call it celebrities, especially in the um, in the days of um reality TV where celebrities' lives have actually become a part of the media that we consume. Have a look at some of these ones. 
he started dating her while she was still married to her first husband, and their marriage was also a reality TV experience. I think they've now split up. Okay, and she's going out with someone else. These two, I think they've also split up now, haven't they? Yeah, well, she started dating him while he was still married to his first wife, and it was her third marriage. Celebrities don't fare any better than anyone else in the world. These people, they're part of a media industry that sells a, a, a picture of love and romance and what it means to get together, but they aren't struggling. And this isn't to criticize these people, okay, apart from Rose from Titanic, but it's meant to show that just as people, okay, they're no better off than anyone else. And this is not a new thing, okay? Uh, what's her name? Pride and Prejudice. Jane Austen. Never got married, couldn't get it together. All right, had a guy she fancied, couldn't get the marriage to work, never ended up marrying anyone else, died alone, apart from the family. All right, so these people are not role models when it comes to marriages and long term relationships, and yet the world has set them up as the role models for our impressionable children. To consume what's being sold to them, and, it, and it's a it's a bit of a nightmare. There. Okay, with poor role models, many young people, and indeed nowadays, many older people don't know where to start with relationships and marriage. But with many bad role models, many young people and many old people have unhealthy ideas, actively unhealthy ideas about where to start with the relationship and the marriage. So where should we start? Marriages start with good relationships. Without a good relationship, you don't, you cannot have a good marriage. Of course, physical intimacy is a normal part of very strong and personal relationships. And we are using the euphemism physical intimacy for the kinds of intimacy appropriate for married couples. I'm not going to say any more about that one. Okay, John 4. We read about this, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. God operates a spirit of flame. We said before, physical intimacy is a need of the flesh. Okay? And in 1 Thessalonians 4, uh, thank you, for this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. God has clear expectations of when physical intimacy is appropriate and when it is not. And uh, all furthermore, in 1 Corinthians, Chapter 7, it's good for a man not to touch a woman, nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Marriage is the appropriate relationship for physical intimacy. Okay? Appropriate, i.e., based on the foundations of love, care, respect, appreciation, and, and forgiveness. A, a physical intimacy is a healthy part of a marriage. And if you don't believe in Greek Song of Solomon, not said. Song of Solomon. Marriage can, uh, this is George Bernard Shaw, marriage is possible because it combines the maximum of temptation with the maximum of opportunity. You can figure that one out for yourself. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we read, I have written to you in my letter, in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral, but now I'm writing you. We must not associate with anyone who calls himself a brother that is sexually immoral, that's in the NIV. And in Ephesians chapter 5, the fornication and uncleanness and covetousness, let it not be named a once named amongst you as become saints. So immorality, physical intimacy outside of marriage is not to be tolerated within the church. And we have made a stand for God's expectations, and sexually immoral people will be permanently dismissed from our church. Okay, once again, we're not judging the world, we're setting uh, we're holding up standards for within our culture. Okay. So let's have a quick think about weddings. All right. Let's think about wedding dresses, uh, wedding cake, all right, the wedding receptions, the honeymoons, the vast buckets of money that they all cost when put together. The actual key that many of the Instagrammable moments miss. The actual key to a wedding is the commitment, all right? Because if you think about it, when the when are the couple pronounced man and wife? It's not when the dress is fitted. 
It's not when the cake is made, it's not at the reception, and it's not during the honeymoon, it's when they have made their vows of, and they've made their commitment one to another. And this comes to the heart of what marriage is in the Bible. So commit in the dictionary is to obligate or bind oneself or somebody else to a course of action or a set of beliefs. It also interestingly means the place in a prison or psychiatric hospital. You can make it. <laughs> you can make it that as well. Okay, so if we think about the marriage vows, so let's have a quick look at some of the some of the more traditional ones have been knocking around for a while. To have and to hold from this day forward for better, for worse, for richer, for poor, in sickness and in health. To love and to cherish until I die, according to God's holy commandments, and to this end I give my word. There is a commitment to maintain a positive relationship despite the circumstances. Not, not as driven by circumstances, but despite the circumstances. There is a commitment to maintain God's standards, including his standards of marriage, and his standards of physical intimacy. We'll keep going with this, the marriage of, uh, with this ring I then leave, with my body I then worship, and with all my worldly goods I be in now, in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Ghost. I mean, there is a commitment to interdependence and selflessness. All right? And these vows are made personally, in front of witnesses, and in the sight of Almighty God, which is a contract, which is both, uh, which is verbal, because it's vows, it's written, we sign a registry. It's symbolic in the giving and receiving of rings. It's society, people, there's a whole bunch of social meaning associated with all of this. It's legal in that it's tied to legislation and it's based on God's word. That is a that is a lot of commitment. If you're buying a profit a, a block of land, you'll you'll make a commitment which is tied up to legislation and social expectation that you're not going to swap rings with the person you're buying, you know, the, the land from. You're not going to get all of your friends together and have like a land wedding where it's like, here is the land. I, you, you, do you take this parcel of land? I do. None of that. Marriage is such a, a, a remarkable commitment in the amount of levels of, of, of um, legality there is to it. Right. Bob oh, Hope Landers has said marriage is a great institution and no family should be without it. Uh, marriage is a contract between two people. Whose relationship is the rest of the high level, marriage should be based on a good relationship, and the key to marriage is commitment. Marriage is an appropriate place of physical intimacy, and appropriate physical intimacy has a place in a healthy marriage, and inappropriate physical intimacy has no place in God's church. So let's have a quick look at some of the biblical con um, contractual obligations. Uh, May West said, Love conquers all things, except poverty and toothache. You need commitment at a time like that. All right, so first Corinthians chapter seven, if a brother hath a wife that believes not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. And the woman which hath a husband that believes not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. Just because a partner doesn't fellowship is not an acceptable cause for divorce. Okay, uh, we keep reading there. Uh, for the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified, set apart by the husband. But if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases. Just because a partner doesn't fellowship is not acceptable cause for divorce, but abandonment is. If they get up and leave you, breaking the commitment they made, we just read there, you are not under bondage in such cases. Okay, they have broken their commitment to you. That commitment has been broken, not by you. You were happy to stay with them, okay, because we got that, we just read that in the verses before, in the in the because that's not an excuse for divorce, but they left you. Okay, they have broken the marriage commitment. Okay, let's keep reading. For what knowest thou, O what wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband, or knowest thou, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? And so the Lord's got a purpose for why we don't break that commitment. Okay? They may repent. They may wise up. They may come back. But if they don't, and they abandon you, okay, they left the marriage. All right? Now, 
an interest in community systems of service and psychology, four different ways of responding to a problem. Um, and it's got whether it's passive, active, or positive, or negative. So, for example, a passive positive response is waiting for improvement to happen. It's passive, I'm not doing anything, okay, but I think that, you know, it's, it'll get fixed. I'm just going to wait for it to fix itself. A passive negative is allowing problems to fester, up, right? An active, a, 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 a active negative response is actively trying to end the relationship. Right, whereas an active positive response is working at improving the relationship. So, interestingly enough, the worst, according to psychologists, the worst response in a, in a relationship is a passive negative. Okay, the worst problem in a relationship is not conflict, it's actually just allowing things to affect up because what's the point of even trying? Okay, and and the worst problem apparently according to psychologists is the loss of positive feelings for each other. You're not even worth the effort of trying to break up with. Okay, in other words, the worst problem in marriages tends to be bad relationships, and the best response is to fix the relationship, remembering. It takes two to fix the relationship. The saddest problem in a marriage, of course, is when you've got one person who's trying to fix the relationship and one who's actively harming it or just letting it fall apart. Okay, because that's incredibly unbalanced. We go back to our marriage vows to have and to hold from this day forward for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and health, to love and to cherish until I die according to God's holy commandments. This is where the commitment comes in. It's easy to maintain the commitment when things are good, but it's only meaningful to maintain the commitment when things are rough. Um, to the marriage, I give this man in verse 3, chapter 7, verse 10. Uh, to the marriage, I give this man, not I, but the Lord. A wife must not separate from a husband. Interestingly, separation is not a valid cause for divorce, but as it goes on to say, but if she does, she must remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. The husband must not divorce his wife. There are valid reasons for separation. There are perfectly valid set reasons for separation, but you are still committed to that person unless they then walk out on you. All right? Okay, Matthew chapter 5. It has been said anyone who divorces his wife must give her a, a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for marital unfaithfulness, this is in the NIV. Causes her to become an adulteress, and anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. It clearly states that immorality, physical intimacy outside of marriage, is a valid cause for divorce. So let's have a look at making and breaking a marriage. A, 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 good, a good relationship founded on love, respect, appreciation, child through how people feel and think and how they are and how they act and treat each other, that's a cause for celebration. And if that's the kind of marriage that we've got, celebrate it. Okay? Give someone some roses or a chocolate or a cuddle or a kiss or whatever it is. Celebrate the relationship you've got. If, however, you have a bad relationship, okay, it's lacking love, it's lacking respect, it's lacking appreciation, or it's lacking forgiveness, or these things are not being shown, then that's cause for improvement. Okay, if the relationship is suffering, then you try and improve the relationship. But a betrayed relationship because of either physical immorality or abandonment is cause for divorce. Okay, they have broken the commitment they made, they have walked out on you or they've betrayed you. That's cause for divorce. All right, so let's have a look at the keys. <clears throat> a bad relationship isn't a cause for divorce, it's a cause to fix the relationship. If someone uses that as an excuse, to walk out on you, they're in the wrong. Okay, separation is not a cause for divorce. Abandonment, basically then divorcing you, breaking the marriage contract with you, and immorality of causes for divorce. And commitment can achieve improvement, as we saw with the Lord there saying, but who knows if your faith may, may prevent.
bring them back. But, uh, but of course, two people, one person's commitment cannot do the commitment for the other person. Both people have to show commitment. So have a look at the husbands and wives. All right. First Corinthians chapter 7. Um, the husband should give his wife her conjugal rights, goodwill, kindness, and want to view her as his wife, and like a wife to her husband. For the wife does not have exclusive authority and control over her own body, but the husband has his rights. And likewise, uh, also the husband does not have exclusive authority and control over his body, but the wife has her rights. Husbands and wives are interdependent. And if we read in Genesis chapter 2, therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his flesh, wife and they shall be one flesh, we cannot operate as individuals without considering the cost for the other person. We go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Uh, that there should be no shipping in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether they're one member suffer, all the members suffer with it, or one member, member beyond it, all the members rejoice with it. When one partner struggles, the other should have empathy and care. Okay, independence is hurt by lack of empathy and care. All right. Furthermore, in 1 Corinthians 7, do not deprive each other of marital rights, except perhaps by mutual consent for a time. Decisions and commitments have an effect on the other partner. And therefore, if you are wanting to do something, or whatever the case may be, which affects your partner, it should be by mutual consent. You just can't operate as an individual. I want to do this, I want to do that. We seem to have bred a culture in our society where we say each, you know, husbands live in sheds and wives live in wardrobes and they're each their own domains and they make their own decisions. And nowadays, more and more people are getting relationships and keeping their finances separate because they're not becoming one, they're just becoming two married individuals. And they're making decisions that are having an effect on the other person without any consideration for the other person because they think they have the right to make that decision for themselves. And the Bible is clearly saying, no, your decision has an effect, impact on the other person. The more impact they have, the more it should be a consensual decision. The two of you, together. Okay? Where are we up to? Oh, this is a good one. I once had Norm Ruff say to me, I've, I've done a lot of ridiculous sins, but I would never I would never tackle this verse in front of the in front of an assembly. Let's read it. Why submit yourselves to your own husbands as unto the Lord? For the, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the saviour of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wife be to their own husbands and everything. Wives should, should submit to their husbands. Full stop. Now I will buy your minds. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 11, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. So husbands should submit to their wives. Full stop. It's in the same chapter. Let's uh, have a look at this. Uh, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Husbands should love their wives. But we should keep reading. So all men should love their wives as their own bodies. He that loves his wife loves himself, for no man ever yet hates his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, even as the Lord the church. Husbands should love their wives a lot. But in John chapter 13, as we heard in the gifts earlier, a new commandment I give unto you that you love one another as I have loved you, that you may also love one another. And by this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one to another. Wives should love their husbands. So to say to wives, you should submit to your husband, and to the husband, you should love your wives, is not revolutionary. It's not radical. Because we're all supposed to submit to each other, we're all supposed to love each other. So, what is it? Uh, why have we got these specially directed instructions there? We'll get to that. Linda May Johnson um, said, I have learned there that only two things are necessary to keep one's wife happy. First, let her think she's having her own way. And second, let her have it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think that those verses are actually about the difference between generally male society and female society 
when you see people operating, uh, see them operating as groups. Men's relationships tend to be based on respect. And if you see the way they bully each other and the way they form groups in the yard, it's about who's top dog and who's the victim. Okay, every group wants to have a top dog, everyone wants to be the top dog, but every group also wants to have a pet victim, okay, which is the bottom dog. All right, and you know, you don't want to be the pet victim for any group. It's a miserable place to be. It's funny if you're watching. No, actually, it's not funny at all, but I have heard some stories that are funny. But anyway, we won't go there. So the point is, that's how males' relationships tend to go. Women's relationships tend to be based on emotional connection and networks. Okay, it's all about who's in and who's out of the, you know, the, 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 all these kind of things. All right? Men tend to show their relationships through respect. Okay, and women tend to show their relationships through care. What's important though is that men also show their relationship through care and women also show their relationship through respect. Or I don't think that these verses are basically trying to put women in a submissive position and men in a lordship position. I think it's instead saying you need to address the emotional needs of the other person, not yourself. And I've had times in my own relationship where Mari is complaining to me about a thing and I'm trying to fix it when she just wants me to give her a cuddle. Okay, and when I give her the cuddle, apparently everything's okay. And as a man, that seems ridiculous because if I love her, I'll respect her and I'll fix the thing. She doesn't want the thing fixed. She wants me to know that I love her. And this verse tells me, don't forget to make her feel loved. I can treat her like a man and treat her with respect, but that's not going to meet her needs. And the converse is applied. Where Mari's giving me all of these cuddles and stuff, but she's not listening to me. All right? I'm not feeling respected. I don't feel the love that she's shown me because she's showing me the kind of love that she would like. We have to be aware of the emotional needs of the other. Please note the colors don't mean anything to you. Go. In Colossians chapter 3, it says, Wives submit yourselves to your own husbands as is fit in the Lord. Husbands love your wife and be not fear against them. This is more than a simple meaning of each other's emotional needs. First Peter chapter 3. This is uh, likewise and wives being subjected to your own husbands that if any of may not the word, they also may, I'm not even showing it to you. Um, and if they may not the word, they may also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives while they behold a chaste conversation coupled with fear. There seems to be a special respect. Anyway, we keep going. In like manner, you married women be submissive to your own husband, subordinate yourself as being secondary to them and dependent on them, and adapt yourselves to them, so that even if they do not obey the word of God, they may be won over not by discussion, but by the godly lives of their wives. Okay, why they observe, uh, when they observe the pure and modest way in which you conduct yourselves together with your reverence, your husband, uh, you are to feel for him all that reverence includes to respect, to fur, revere him. To honor, esteem, appreciate, prize, and in the human sense to adore him, that is, to admire, praise, be devoted to, deeply love, and be joy for a husband. And that, let me amplify, that does seem a little bit of sex, a little bit sexist. Okay? And yet, in the same way you married men should live considerably with your wives, in the same way. In the same way, with an intelligent recognition of the marriage relation, honoring your women, uh, the women as physically the weaker, but realizing that you are point heirs of grace, God's unmerited favor of life. Men should love their wives in the same way, and men should be aware of women's vulnerability. And that's not necessarily you're probably more likely to beat them up than they can beat you up. There is all manner of ways in which females uh, uh, don't have the same privileges as men in our society, okay? Physical limitations to their finances and things like that. 
Okay, Ephesians chapter 5. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he may sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water. Husbands, of course, have a great love, respect, and appreciation for your wife. So we've got this interdependence, equality, and difference. Husbands and wives are interdependent. This special respect and love are also interdependent, but they are given rather than demanded. Neither the husband nor wife should suffer because of these gifts. Love, respect, submission, care, none of these things should cause anyone to suffer. They are gifts that we give to our beloved. They are not demands that we shake down from a, from a person we're in contact with. Okay, neither the husband nor the wife should suffer because it gives remembering and honour preferring one another from Romans chapter 12. Is this a universal rule? Are all men the providers? Are all women nurturing? No. But there is enough of a pattern across cultures, through history uh, and time, that this is a common situation. God has given advice to the most common situation because that's the best kind of advice. It should never, ever be used to hurt, humiliate, or pigeonhole people. That is not the purpose of the Word of God. In Proverbs 31, remember that a wife of noble character, who can find, she is worth far more than rubies. Husbands have valued their wives above earthly possessions. In Luke chapter 12, for unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall be much required, and to whom men have committed much, of him they will ask the more. If men do have any advantages, then they are to use those advantages to give more for their wives. Okay, throughout history, male have had control of the finances and things like that. The idea is that men use whatever they are advantaged in to show their care for their precious wives because their precious wives are more valuable to them than any earthly possession. So, poor treatment of women. You cannot read these verses and put them together and justify the poor treatment of wives. In fact, if anything, men are called to give more love, more care, more respect, and more appreciation, because generally throughout history, they have had more power, more money, more rights, and more freedom. There is simply no place for violence, intimidation, abuse, coercive control, or any of this, any form of mistreatment in the Lord's church. It is, it is against his will. It is it's just wrong. But all of these things are meant to work together. All of these elements are meant to come together into a beautiful thing. Okay, one element is not meant to negate the need for the others. It's not a case of your respect for me has to come first and nothing else matters until I get it. Okay, the, 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 all the elements are given rather than demanded. It's meant to be a, just a whole cycle of love, care, and respect, where all these things are being tried in all directions. There is equality and interdependence forming a foundation for the fact that men and women are different. The people in the marriage are different. First Peter chapter three. Whose adorning let it not be that of outward adorning and plaiting of hair and the wearing of gold or the putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart, in that which it is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. A beautiful character, men, women, both, is more important than a beautiful appearance. And the testimony of our marriages comes. From the beautiful character we character traits we bring to bear in our marriages. That's what shines what God's a God's nature. Okay? Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, his Lord as he are, as long as you do well and are not afraid with any amazement, likewise the husbands dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the vessel, and being heirs together of the grace of life. That your prayers be not hindered. Know your wives, how best to care for them, protect and care for your wives, aware of their vulnerabilities, and remember that your partner is also your brother and sister in the Lord. And in verse, uh, we'll keep reading then. Uh, finally, be ye of one mind, having compassion one of another, love as brethren, be pitiful, not good, uh, be courteous, 
not rendering either grief or rail on the ground, but contrary rights, blessing, knowing that you are there unto Paul, that you should inherit a blessing. Both husbands and wives and everyone else should have unity, compassion, love, pity, be forgiving and encouraging. And as we read there, this is our calling. Remember, our relationships with each other are like a flag for our relationship with God. Okay, reading. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no God. Let him eschew evil and do good, let him seek peace and ensue it. So if you want a good life, speak well, be trustworthy, seek and work for peace. And this is all practical advice on how to show love, respect, appreciation, and forgiveness. There is great blessing if the marriage works well. And there is great blessing in it. It's a wonderful thing. Let's have a look at the keys. Generally, God has the same expectations of men and women in marriage. However, God also recognizes that men and women have different emotional needs, and God wants partners to look after each other's emotional needs, not just their own. If anything, men are expected to use any social and physical advantage they have to give more love, care, respect, and appreciation. Respect for husbands and love for wives should never cause hurt. They should be given, not demanded. Special respect and love should operate on a foundation of mutual love, respect, appreciation, and forgiveness. And there is no place for mistreatment in God's church. So successful marriages. Here's some interesting research. According to the psychologists, marriages are likely to have more problems if either partner has lived with other partners previously, the couple has lived together before they were married, and the couple has children before they get married, either together or with someone else. In other words, God's expectations of marriage are actually well supported by research. Some cultural universals, falling in love, marriage, and marriage ceremonies. These pretty much happen in every society that we know of, both now and throughout history. As uh, Paul Gray, psychologist, said, we are a romantic species. We're also a marrying species. In every culture, adults of child producing age enter long-term union sanctioned, sanctioned by law or social custom. But here's some things that aren't so universal. It isn't universal to fall in love before you marry. In many cultures, you fall in love. The expectation is you learn to love after you've got married. Marriage comes before love, and it is not less likely to be, if marriage comes before love, it is not less likely to end up less loving. In fact, arranged marriages, according to the statistics, are slightly ahead when it comes to how loving they are. Because the societies that tend to have help, uh, arranged marriages are much more likely to have clear expectations about you learn to love and treat, you know, very clear roles. Okay? The expectations of faithfulness and marriage commitment varies between cultures. Some cultures value love more than marriage, and some cultures value marriage more than love. Uh, as Peter Brown says, love and marriage do not necessarily go together, but they often do. And in most cultures, they combination. The combination of both love and marriage is considered the ideal that they're working towards. So what does this mean? A quality relationship and a firm commitment is more important, important than how a couple meet or what people expect of them. Okay? Or you have the relationship, the foundation for marriage, and then you have the commitment or the contract of marriage. And if you think about it, love plus marriage is the ideal. Love and marriage goes together <laughs> like a horse and carriage. This I tell you, brother, you can't have one without the other. Or, as Phyllis Diller said, never go to bed angry, stay up and fight. <laughs> or, Ogden Asher, famous quote, to keep your marriage brimming with love in the loving cup whenever you're wrong, admit it, whenever you're right, shut up. <laughs> okay, some interesting uh, research. 
Marriage is a white of being successful if there is respect for respectful physical intimacy. There is a deep level of commitment. They share a way of solving mutual problems. The couples actually the couple actually likes each other. That's, a, that's apparently a good start. And the best friends and confidence. They are more focused on we rather than I. They value interdependence rather than independence. They and, and successful relationships argue as much as unhappy couples, but they argue constructively. They're both trying to solve the problem rather than win the argument. Okay, furthermore, um, they're likely to be successful if they genuinely listen to each other. Uh, they focus on solving rather than winning or being right. Like I said that. Uh, they show respect rather than contempt for each other. So the honeymoon is terribly terrible of a relationship. Okay, they don't bring up past hurts or grievances that are irrelevant to the current issue, but if it's relevant, go for it. Okay, they intersperse arguments with positive comments and humor to reduce tension. Even during an argument, they're trying to make things better for them, for each other. Okay, here's another couple of things. Two, uh, some psychologists talk about two different kinds of love. Passionate love versus compassionate love. Passionate love is, you know, you're a teenager and you fall in love with that person. Intense emotional state, confusion. Oh, oh, oh. Okay, there's tenderness, attraction, desolation, and pain. Oh, it's so hard, I can't bear it. All right. That's passionate love. Compassionate love is characterized by friendly affection, deep attachment, friendship and understanding, and concern for the well-being of the other. And when it comes to maintaining a relationship over a long time, compassionate love is the one that works. Passionate love is amazing and then it fizzles. Okay, and you need to have developed compassionate love. Okay, for a marriage to have any chance every day, at least six things should go on set. Okay, marriage is a contract, requires a trust that the other person will keep faithful to their commitment. It requires a commitment. It works best with a good relationship. Married couples are interdependent, and each person needs to be concerned with the needs of the other. There are no guarantees. We are dealing with people. People can break our trust. So, in conclusion, a lot of people just the side relief. Marriage is a contract between two people whose relationship has progressed to a high level. It requires trust and commitment, and it should be based on a good relationship and is the appropriate place for physical intimacy. A bad relationship isn't cause for a divorce, it's cause to fix the relationship. Separation is not a cause for divorce. Abandonment and immorality are causes for divorce. God wants partners to look after each other's emotional needs, not just their own. And if anything, if, if this is true, if men have any, any advantages, they're supposed to use those advantages to look after their wives better. Okay, there is no place for mistreatment and trust, uh, mistreatment in the birth. In birth, it's birth. There's no place for mistreatment in God's church, but we are dealing with people. There will still be problems. As the proverb says, where the, where the, what's the word? Um, it's not the normal word. Basically, it means stable. Where the stable is a, a sorry, no, it's it's. I don't know what I'm Basically, what it's saying is the only way you ever have a thing stable is if there's no animals. The only way you'll have a, a problem-free relationship is if there's no people. In it. You know, it's a similar thing. As soon as you bring people in, there's going to be problems. People. Okay, so consider here's the action. So here's the takeaway. Consider your marriage and consider your commitment to your marriage. Have you kept faith to your commitment? And don't just think about that, oh, well, yes, I haven't killed her, you know, and I haven't moved to Uganda or whatever. But have you, have you maintained your commitment to love and care and respect and appreciate and, and show forgiveness? Okay? Have you upheld the relationship, in other words, in the marriage? Or have you become too distracted by your everyday life and taken your marriage relationship for granted? Recommit to the relationship in your marriage. It, it's never too late to get up in the morning and say, you know what? Today's a good day to make my partner feel really, really, really good. 
Okay. Consider the difficulties in your marriage relationship because they all have them. Have you slipped into a passive approach and just letting them fester? If I just shut up and don't say anything, they'll go away. They'll gnaw my ear off and then they'll go away. Have you become negative and you're actually burning the relationship? <laughs> have you lost your positive feeling towards your partner? And I have to admit, Mari and I watched Tom uh, Top Gun recently. You must that love and be <laughs> Have you tried to fix your partner rather than the relationship? Which is also a terrible, terrible thing. Recommit to maintaining a positive attitude towards your partner and your problems. These are just overcomings to work together to solve. Okay, next, consider your role as a husband or wife. Have you focused too much on your needs and wants? Have you forgotten the needs and wants of your partner? Do you even know the needs and wants of your partner? Recommit to listening and learning the needs and wants of your partner so that you are more able to meet them. Consider the successfulness of your marriage. Do you hold yourself solely responsible for the success or failure of your marriage relationship? Or do you hold your partner solely responsible? Or are you, are you acting as independent people? You are interdependent for better or worse. Recommit to your personal responsibility and learn to accept the responsibility of your partner. And consider your day-to-day -day behaviors. When was the last time you consciously and actively made your partner feel loved? When was the last time you consciously and actively made your partner feel respected? When was the last time you consciously and actively made your partner feel appreciated? Or when was the last time you made them feel awake? Set a goal of doing each of these things actively and consciously each day. That's it. 